honor that I get to introduce the next two speakers. The first speaker is Dr. Kevin Emanuel. So I've known Dr. Kevin for quite some time now. He's been a great friend, great colleague, and we're very lucky to have him at Houston Methodist Hospital. Dr. Emanuel completed his neurology residency here at Baylor and followed that with his fellowship at UT Houston. He's currently the medical director of our neuro ICU, and he also sits on many steering committees in the hospital. So without further ado, Dr. Emanuel. Thank you. Thank you for having me, and thank you, Dr. Tino. Thank you, Dr. Volpe, for the invitation. So uh, let me stop my timer, because I do have uh, the uh, ability to become very loquacious. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, stroke ICU care. Um, uh, as part of the stroke, really, uh, for patient care, uh, one of the pivotal parts in taking care of patients with this uh, severe neurologic uh, illness is really the ICU uh, care. Uh, so my objectives, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the indication for ICU monitoring. We're going to be talking about airway oxygen management, uh, blood pressure control, glycemic control, and also some of the management of our common complications. So ICU uh, management, I'll, I'll put it in a very simple term. If, if you think your patient needs ICU, call the ICU so that the patients can be managed there because quite a few things go, are going on. Even if it's not a systemic, uh, even if it's not a brain issue, systemic uh, complications do have a role in playing uh, in the recovery of brain injury. Uh, a lot of our patients will of course show up after they've received uh, fibrinolytic uh, therapy, uh, uh, mechanical thrombectomy. Uh, a lot of our patients are going to be coming from the ED, so I really do appreciate our ED physicians as well as our uh, vascular uh, uh, neurologists, especially our teleneuro, so we do get a lot of referrals as we serve as a quaternary uh, center. Uh, large uh, infarcts, posterior circulation infarcts, patients who are fluctuating uh, neurologic illnesses, uh, even for blood pressure management. Uh, those are all of the things that really do need to come to the ICU for at least monitoring for 24 hours. So some of the goals, general goals, uh, of course, is to get your patients to be better. But one of the things that the ICU really offers is to, while we cannot reverse the primary injury, our focus is to prevent additional secondary injury and really provide patients support and minimize uh, some of the complications that can happen. And one of the foundations of the way that we deliver care is that it's really individualized to the patient's needs. And we also want to support the family as well because they are going through this with their patient, with their loved one who you know, has a sudden onset change uh, that really can affect the rest of their lives. So some of the basics with any really ICU patients, it's airway, breathing, circulation, disability, exposure, and for neuro ICU, neuro checks, neuro checks, neuro checks, neuro checks. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, airway and oxygenation. Uh, one of the things that we want to ensure is that our patients actually has the ability to breathe. Uh, not just breathe, but breathe well. So breathing patterns, which can vary depending on the location of the strokes, are important clues to what you know, the patient may further need. Uh, most of our patients really just need to keep the, the uh, pulse ox above uh, 94. There's really no need to hyperoxygenate these patients. Um, and uh, a, a lot of our patients, uh, especially those with large territory uh, infarcts, will end up requiring some form of support. Um, including intubation and ventilator management. So uh, this is kind of what I uh, mentioned already, but one of the things I want to specifically point out, especially uh, as a side effect of using TPA is angioedema. Um, so angioedema, not everybody needs to be intubated, but the, the thing about angioedema is that you need to recognize it early. If you recognize it early and you actually intervene by giving these patients steroids, giving them antihistamine, uh, there's a good chance that uh, if, these, if this is just a partial um, uh, angioedema that you may not need to uh, intubate these patients. However, it's always better to recognize what the patient needs before the tongue actually swells up uh, so that you can secure an airway without having to do uh, additional surgical emergent procedures. <coughs> 
Um, so I'm going to kind of skip over these um, because these are typically things that we do as part of our neural uh, checks, really just making sure that if there is any change in these patients, we can pick up any uh, worsening uh, and really try to uh, ameliorate whatever the complications may be. But early recognition, as I mentioned, is pivotal. So in addition to um, just neuro checks, one of the other things that we do see is uh, patients who come back from endovascular suite. Uh, even if there's not an uh, intervention in these patients, a lot of them may show up with, syst with uh, systemic issues, things like they lose their pulse, they have uh, groin hematomas, uh, which may not be apparent, especially since you can store quite a bit of blood in the thigh. Or, um, also, in the, not quite as much in the, in the radius, depending on the location of entry. But you want to ensure that there is a way for you to continue to monitor those sites and really recognize uh, when there are complications. Uh, to, and in some of these cases, really save the patient's limb. Now, let's talk a little bit about blood pressure and circulation. Now, blood pressure is an, an extremely important tool. Um, oftentimes our patients are going to come in hypertensive. Um, uh, one of the things that I, I, I always mention is that we want to ensure, especially for patients who are going to be intubated, that we have a clear way of monitoring these patients' blood pressure. So oftentimes we will put in A-lines, typically uh, uh, depending on what the patients really need. But hi avoiding hypotension is one of the paramount things, um, and I'll talk in, in a second about that. But also, you don't want the extremes of blood pressure as well as um, they can have uh, poor effects on the patient's uh, already tenuous brain. Um, for patients who are hypotensive, uh, how do you kind of manage these patients? Uh, one of the things that we do is that we try to avoid, as assess the patient's volume status. Uh, oftentimes, there's really no benefit to putting these patients on pressors. You really want to figure out why this hypotension uh, is occurring, so a lot of times you give these patients volume. Now, the type of fluids that you give uh, patients does matter because fluids to me are like any other medications. They do have kind of their own risk versus benefits. So staying away from hypotonic sal uh, saline uh, for resuscitation is uh, ideal. So we already kind of mentioned this a little bit. And then stopping their blood pressure medications. Oftentimes I have seen cases where the patients may still be under the effects of uh, their oral blood pressure medications or even IV. Um, in part of evaluating the patients as well, one of the unique things that we do have in the ICU uh, that helps us really manage these patients very quickly is that we have the use of ultrasound. We can use that to not just uh, do a, a stat bedside echo, try to assess the patient's volume status, but we can also uh, figure out other line etiologies because oftentimes patients do not just present with one uh, particular thing. Sometimes patients also present with MI, for example. And then management of uh, patients' arrhythmias, because oftentimes uh, atrial fibrillation, uh, there, there are quite a few things that need to really help the patient become hemodynamically st uh, stable. So a little bit more about blood pressure management, especially when the blood pressure is elevated. As the patient has, come, uh, has undergone TPA, for example, and has undergone mechanical thrombectomy and we've set a parameter. How do we achieve those parameters? Now, there are really two big ways. It's either you give an IV push um, or you start the patients on drips. Typically, if I've given more than two pushes and we're still out of the range, I would typically start a drip. Uh, my preference for drips is because I want to avoid uh, really wide swings in the patient's blood pressure because I think that that variability does play a big role uh, in the overall patient's outcome. At least we see that also in uh, patients who have ICH. Glycemic control, glucose control. Um, in addition to hypoglycemia being a mimic, um, really uh, having a patient who is hypoglycemic uh, it, with an acute stroke actually worsens uh, a patient's outcome. So that's one of the reasons why it's one of the level one recommendations that you do need to check blood sugars and really continue on a continuous basis. And oftentimes patients will present with diabetes as well. So these patients will really need uh, stringent monitoring. Now, do you need to really do an intensive uh, glucose control uh, versus something uh, that's a little bit more liberal given these patients? Uh, blood sugars between 140 to 180. 
there's really no benefit to doing a, a really intense control. However, if a patient with diabetes presents with DKA, do not forget about the comorbidities, and that's one of the things that we do offer as well. Uh, dysphagia. Uh, dysphagia and nutrition. Uh, one of the other important factors that we uh, monitor as part of the patient's uh, ongoing recovery, because part of the ICU is also, in my opinion, kind of an early recovery process, is to establish gastric access. You do not want these patients to go without um, nutrition for a period of time. Um, in, in, as I just previously mentioned, hypoglycemia is one of those things that can really worsen the patient's uh, outcome because you're, you're not just, this is not just a patient who has in brain injury, but also you're depriving the brain of adequate nutrition uh, that it needs to uh, continue its uh, function. Uh, the recommendation is really to start within seven days, but typically we do try to do that a lot earlier. If a patient cannot be fed within seven days, there's typically a lot more else kind of going on as far as complications are concerned. Now, uh, use of uh, anti-thrombotic, uh, the timing, after TPA or fibrinolytics, wait 24 hours typically after the scan to ensure that these patients are not bleeding. Um, and uh, current recommendations are really aspirin, and it really depends on the underlying etiology to, uh, for what will be started, if it's gonna be dual platelets, for example, de depending on what the stroke etiology is. Heparin, uh, I oftentimes see this uh, in some of our community hospitals. There's really uh, not a routine use of heparin trip. A few times that you could consider uh, early anticoagulation, which really needs to be a bigger discussion among the team members, uh, weighing the risk versus the benefits uh, if a patient, for example, has an intracardiac thrombus, uh, if the stroke is actually a venous infarct, uh, as a form of venous sinus thrombosis, if there's dissection, um, if the patient also has systemic issues like pulmonary uh, emboli that's actually causing hemodynamic uh, compromise. Um, or uh, in quite a few cases, uh, uh, patients who may have occluded uh, artery from the, from the endovascular insertion site where there's a loss of limb, uh, a discussion has to be made as far as weighing the benefits versus the uh, risk. Uh, but for most patients, we typically, especially those with AFib, it's given, depending on the size of the, uh, and the location as well of the stroke uh, will kind of determine the timing of initiation of anticoagulation. Rehabilitation, this is uh, one part that I truly uh, appreciate is you want to get these patients really assessed as to what their needs are uh, because uh, early assessment is, 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 is vital in really the patient's recovery. And this also helps us as we kind of build this uh, build around the patient and their families as far as what their recovery plan looks like, if there is any opportunity for recovery. Complications. Uh, some of the uh, common complications, of course, hemorrhagic conversion. Uh, uh, particularly, I recently had a patient, actually two days ago, that had a large hemorrhage after receiving um, IV TPA. Uh, and uh, these risk factors typically are larger strokes, patients with an older age, if they have underlying coagulopathies, for example, and this typically you will see these within the first 24 hours. So how do you manage that when, when this does occur? Um, first, you want to really establish that that's what's going on, so a stat CT scan, making sure that these patients airway, their breathing, their circulation, all those things are stable, uh, giving patient cryoprecipitate. Uh, and in some cases, FFP, uh, if cry is not available, but really getting the neurosurgeon involved as well because there might be an opportunity uh, for neurosurgical intervention, typically if there's like a cortical or surface bleed. Um, but um, it's also part of our ICP um, or intracranial pressure management, which I'll discuss in just a second. Fevers and infection. Uh, oftentimes, patients uh, with strokes will come in with a really decreased level of consciousness. Oftentimes, they may have uh, infections that are also, uh, that they may present uh, with. So management of really hypothermia is core. Uh, in my practice, what I typically would do is that I will use Tylenol, and if I can't, if that doesn't work, then use a surface cooling device while you know, trying to uh, essentially treat the patient's uh, uh, fever, uh, shivering as well. 
Um, and fever is also one of the uh, things that, uh, for patients with any neurologic illness, even in you and I, if we have a fever or an infection, we're not quite ourselves. Uh, with a patient with uh, acute injury from stroke, the uh, examinations are going to worsen. So we often do a lot of CT scans when the patient actually needs a Tylenol. Some other additional complications include really large strokes that have a cerebral edema and mass effect. Uh, these carry increased mortality, morbidity, a person about 10% of all strokes. Uh, management is going to be a combination of medical management and surgical intervention, but really what is going to save this patient's life is being aware of the patient's deterioration. So if, for example, their neural status is worsening, their level of consciousness is worsening, either measured by NI stroke scale, G GCS, uh, those are all clues that help us intervene um, rather uh, quickly. So patients with uh, anterior circulation, uh, large territory strokes, um, one of the things that uh, we do in management of those patients is really kind of managing their intracranial pressure. Now, most of these patients, they do not. There's not really a good indication for putting an ICP monitor in these patients. Clinical exam, in my opinion, really kind of gives you an idea of what's going on. If this is a patient who's rapidly deteriorating, uh, every step that you take essentially is a uh, time-saving, uh, time-buying uh, process to get the patient to surgical intervention if that is uh, available for the patient. So this is one of the algorithms that we use in our ICU. And really, it's just if you notice that a patient is now having a neuro change, there's a blown pupil, there's a sign of herniation, one of the things that you can do at bedside is raise the head of the bed. The other thing that you can do as well is hyperventilate these patients. Uh, these patients will often need uh, their airways secure, but you can hyperventilate just using an ambu bag. Uh, you don't want to now do this forever. Um, we're just really buying time. Um, Hypertonic saline, I, I, I think I have uh, more, um, I've seen more benefit, at least in my practice, of using 23.4% saline boluses um, rather than mannitol, but you use what you have uh, to essentially buy time until you can uh, take these patients typically for decompressive hemicranium if they do qualify. Uh, some of the uh, as I mentioned, definitive treatment, uh, surgical treatment is really decompressive in the uh, For time's sake, I will move a little bit fa fast. Uh, but one of the things that I do want to mention, because oftentimes we do get a lot of transfers to our ICU for patients who need surgical intervention, is that whenever you're discussing with a family, uh, decompressive hemicrania will save the patient's life. Uh, it, it may preserve the patient's, um, what the patient currently has as far as their neural status, but it's not going to see, it's not going to reverse what has already occurred. And oftentimes, patient's family arrive kind of in distress thinking that surgery is going to improve the overall symptom. Uh, cerebellar infox. Um, because the posterior fossa is such small um, territory, you don't really have a lot of space. So a lot of these patients uh, are ones, especially those that have brainstem compression, uh, the fourth ventricle is compressed and you see hydrocephalus. They will probably need two things, a subopsidal crani as well as an external ventricular drain. Other considerations, seizures. Uh, I do not really, uh, there is no real benefit in starting prophylaxic uh, anti-epileptic agents unless the patient actually presents with seizures or status. Uh, treating the patient's delirium, uh, depression, and really beginning to talk to the families and build a report um, helps in the eventual discussions uh, for prognostication, uh, kind of goals of care, and even in some cases, brain dead testing. Thank you.